Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I know it wasn't easy. Um, the, 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 the world is still not quite back to normal and not quite, uh, uh, things are not running quite as smoothly as you would want. I had to do three COVID tests to get here, so uh, they're still making it a little difficult, uh, but, uh, but we're here. Uh, let me, we've got a very mixed group, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I just want to get a sense of the audience and get a sense of who's here. So let me ask you, how many of you have read uh, something, anything by Ayn Rand? All right, so o almost everybody has uh, read something. So it's a more knowledgeable group, although some people here haven't read anything, so we've got a nice mixture. All right, so... Um, we're going to be talking about uh, capitalism. And capitalism, uh, as I see it, uh, capitalism is, is laissez-faire capitalism, real free markets. And the one thing we know about capitalism is that nobody likes it. Right? Nobody likes it. I mean, maybe some young people like it. You go to college, you get all excited about capitalism, and you go to work, and within five years you've forgotten about that, and you vote for the, you know, for the, for the, Liberal Party? Does it yeah. The Liberal Party days of system or something. Yeah, well, the yeah. Liberal Party, which kind of likes yeah. capitalism a little bit, but just not too much. Yeah, yeah, days of system pretty yeah. much, yeah. And generally, in the world in which we live, capitalism is belittled. It's, it, again, it's, it's some kind of vague ideal out there. Uh, we might deregulate a little bit. We might move a little bit towards it, and then there'll be a backlash if we move towards the left. And we seesaw in the center... But you notice that the center moves which direction, generally? Over the last hundred years, which direction has the center moved? Left. 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 Dramatically left. In, in the United States, uh, you know, you can look at the, at the platform of the Democratic Party. It looks like the platform of the Socialist Party 50 years ago. And you look at it in economic issues, and you look at the platform of the Republican Party, and it looks like the platform of the Democratic Party 50 years ago. The center moves left. Everything moves left. And everybody, everybody is at the end when it, comes to, when it comes to really making decisions. People don't like capitalism. They're not interested in capitalism. They don't want capitalism. And the question, I think, that bewilders almost everybody is why. Because, and this is what makes this an interesting question, <clears throat> because the fact is, the historical fact is, the existential fact is, that everywhere, markets, free markets, capitalism, is tried, to, to whatever extent it is tried, it is a massive success. If by success we mean economic growth, human well-being, opportunities for individuals to, to achieve things, capitalism is this unbelievable success it has been for 250 years and then nobody wants it. And that's, that's the real thing that should, you should really ask yourself, how, how does this happen? Right? We've got something that clearly works and we're opposed to it. We don't want it. How does that happen? Right? Usually, uh, if you study economics at school, uh, we assume we're all rational actors and we all want to maximize our utility and we all want to maximize our well-being. If that were the case, we would all be capitalists. Because if you look around the world, right, you can see it. Countries that have more economic freedom have higher standard of living, higher wealth, and more opportunities. You can actually take the economic freedom index. There are a number of them. You, it doesn't matter which one you use, and you can plot a graph of economic freedom versus GDP per capita, versus wealth, versus opportunities, if you can find a measure for that. And you'll see the correlation. The correlation is right there. And you can see it in history. Periods where we let the economies be free, where we leave people alone, where we let people make choices for themselves, where we don't regularly control everything, Periods in which economies grow faster, periods in which we clamp down, we close off, we regulate, we tax, we control people, periods in which there are fewer opportunities, economies grow slower, things don't go as well. 
You can look around the world, geographies. I mean, there's the famous, one of my favorite satellite images ever, right, is, is the satellite image of South and North Korea, right? Have you ever seen this? It's a satellite image at nighttime of the Korean Peninsula. And the South is all lit up, right? Because there's civilization there. They have electricity. And they turn on the lights. And everything is lit up. And North Korea, it's like it was 10,000 years ago. There's not a sign of a light anywhere. It's completely blind. You've got it right there, a little experiment. Now, South Korea is not capitalist, but it's more capitalist than North Korea. It's on that path in terms of being more free markets, where individuals have more freedom, not the full laissez-faire. So we can see a whole spectrum of countries, a whole spectrum over periods of time, and we can see the success. Maybe the freest place, could argue both socially and economically in the 20th century, uh, certainly in the latter half of the 20th century, was Hong Kong. That freedom is gone uh, because China's taking it over to use the, the COVID distraction to basically take over Hong Kong. But Hong Kong was this amazing place, right? 70 years ago, there was nothing there. It's a little fishing village. And then people from all over Asia went there. They swam, they little rafts, they took anything to get to this place, right? Why? Because they provided free health care. No free health care in Hong Kong. Because they gave them, uh, I don't know what they call it now, universal basic income? No, no welfare, very little welfare in Hong Kong. Why do people go there? I mean, if you listen to the social democrats, you'd think Hong Kong would be the most hellish place on earth. None of the wonderful Scandinavian and Northern European, you know, welfare state benefits that, you know, we all, in America, we all envy you guys. Hong Kong had none of that. And yet people wanted to live there. Why? What did they have? Opportunity. Opportunity, that freedom. All they had was the rule of law. Contracts were protected, property rights were protected, and they left you alone. You couldn't even vote. I don't know how many people know, but Hong Kong was never a democracy. You could never even vote. It was ruled by a governor, appointed by the, the Queen, I guess, by the, by the, 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 the government of, of the UK. But freedom of speech was protected, social freedoms were protected, and your economic freedoms were protected. And what happened in Hong Kong? It went from a little fishing village to seven and a half million people. More skyscrapers in Hong Kong than New York City. Higher GDP per capita is one measure of wealth and economic success. Then higher GDP per capita than in the United States. What the United States took 250 years to achieve, Hong Kong did in 70 years. Capitalism works. And yet we don't like it. We don't want it. We constantly move away from it. So why? What's capitalism about? What's capitalism about? Well, more basically, you know, capitalism, we talk about capitalism in terms of free markets, in terms of people being free to exchange goods, to produce what they want to produce, to consume what they want to consume without any regulations and controls and people telling them what they can and cannot do. What are markets about? Why do we go into the marketplace, right? Why, why, why does... Um, here it comes. Why does Steve Jobs make one of these? Why do people go to work? Yeah. Because first of all, he's having the private active work in his economic freedom well, wealth somehow. So this is a private active when it comes to capitalism. Because mostly you control the economy using specific factors. And also in the homeland we're having yeah. that. Yeah, but I'm asking something much simpler. Right? Yeah. Why does Steve Jobs do this? Because it is a simple development, and also it is kind of a simple, like, I wouldn't say privilege, but... But do you think he makes it out of, because it's a symbol? No, it's not because... Does he wake up every morning and say, I'm going to make a symbol? He no. makes it because someone, probably there's a market for because it. Because there's a market, market where there's with it. But there's no market for iPhones. There is, but it is with a high... Plan. There's no market for iPhones until what happened? He made one. Yeah. 
I mean, Steve Jobs created the microfiber phones. Why does Steve Jobs make this? Money. To make money. I'm glad somebody finally said it. <laughs> Don't we all go to work to make money? Don't we start businesses to make money? That's not the main reason. It's not the only reason, maybe. But it's certainly a reason, and I find it always interesting, that it takes a long time for somebody to say make money. But the reason is to make money, and this is indicative of part of the problem we have with capitalism. Why can't we just say, yeah, I do it to make money? To become a dirty bird. What else? To provide yeah. value to society. To provide value to society. Does he wake up every morning saying, I want to provide value to society? To provide for himself and his family to get a better place. So he wants to make, provide to himself. That's to make money. He's making money. Well, why else does he do it? He likes to make beautiful products. Yeah, he loves this. And he wants, to, he wants to make the world a better place. That's how he makes money, right? But he wants to impact the world. But his primary motivation is two, I'd say, primary motivations. He, he loves doing it. Steve Jobs loved doing it. Hopefully, you go to work because you love doing what, you, what you're doing. It's fun. And Steve Jobs wanted to make beautiful things. He wanted to make beautiful things that other people would use, that would make the world a better place. But that was his passion. That was his love. He didn't do it out of a sense of duty to others, out of a sense of duty to the world. He did it out of a sense of deep, inspired passion. And he did to make money. He didn't do it as a charity. Profit margins in these things were very high. <laughs> Still are, I think, very high. So that's why Steve Jobs goes into the market. That's why we go as producers into the market. We go into produce, to produce stuff because we love doing it and because we want to make money at it. That's why we produce, we create, we build, we make stuff. Why do we buy this stuff? That's the other side, right? Why do consumers consume? Right? Since we're talking about the iPhone, I like to tell the story of, of the first iPhone I bought, which I think was 2008, uh, when iPhone came out in late 2007, and I went about bought one in 2008. And if you remember 2008, you guys don't because you're too young, but 2008 was the beginning of the Great Recession, uh, the financial crisis, and I went and bought my iPhone because I wanted to do my part in stimulating the economy because we were going into a recession. Because I know you guys all, when you go shopping, the reason you shop is because you want to make sure people have jobs and you want to help stimulate the economy and you're doing it for the greater good, right? Is that why you buy shoes and clothes and iPhones? No. Why, why do you go shopping? Because it provides value. To who? To yourself. To yourself. So you're going shopping because it's to provide yourself. You're buying stuff, right? For you to make your life better. You hope, right? So why did I buy an iPhone for a thousand dollars? Because you're an egoist. <laughs> no, I think it's my own motive to make a profit out of it in the future. Because if I'm just saying, yeah, but it, who's going to make the profit? Me. You. That's okay. all I need. Yeah. Right. It's you. You're doing it for your reasons, for making your life better. Whether it's an investment in the future, or whether it's just concern. I mean, I don't buy ice cream because I'm investing in the future. I'm buying ice cream because. It tastes good and I want to eat it, <laughs> right? I want to make my life better. So what's the same about producers and consumers in a capital market? What value are they pursuing? Whose value are they pursuing? They're all. Their own. Their own. Capitalism markets, even more broadly than capitalism, even in a non-capitalist economy, markets are places in which individuals go in pursuit of their own values, either as producers or as consumers. It is a place where people are self-interested, where they're going after what they believe, at least, are their interests. They could be wrong, but they believe at the time that their interests are aligned with their actions. So capitalism markets are a system of self-interest. People pursuing their own self-interest. Egoism, somebody said, right? Now, what do we know about self-interest, about egoism? Not from an economic perspective. We just did that little exercise economically. It, it, it completely makes sense. And by the way, why did I buy this for $1,000? Because it's worth what to me? 
more than more than a thousand dollars, right? That's why you buy whatever you buy. You, you the, the the cash in your pocket is worth less to you than the thing that you buy. That's why you're exchanging into Apple. It's worth they would rather have the cash than the iPhone. So what's the nature of these transactions? A win-win transaction. I benefit because I got an iPhone instead of the cash, and Apple benefit because they don't want the iPhones. They want the cash. Same with any product you buy. You benefit, and the person selling you benefits. Otherwise, you wouldn't transact. Right? It's only people like, I'm allowed to be in politics, it's only people like Donald Trump who think that trade is lose-lose or win-lose. Right? The whole point of trading is to screw the other guy. <laughs> to make them worse off. That's not how the real world works. In the real world, you trade in a way that both parties benefit. Certainly if you want to ever trade with them again. So markets are about self-interested action. What do we know about self-interest from a moral perspective? We put aside economics. We put aside politics. What did our mothers teach us about self-interest? What did our preachers teach us about self-interest? I don't know what it's like in the Netherlands, right? You're, what are you, Protestants, mainly Protestants? We've got one Jew here. But, uh, <laughs> I know what my Jewish mother taught me. I'm American, though. He's American, so he's not American. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Everybody teaches everybody the same, pretty much. My Jewish mother taught me never be selfish. Never think of yourself. Think of others first, always. Always think of other people first. Be self less. Selfless. Think about that word. Selfless. No self. So in anything you do in life, you shouldn't think about yourself. I mean, that's really hard, actually impossible. But that's moral. That's virtue. To be virtuous is not to think of yourself. What is virtue? Not to think of yourself and to sacrifice for other people. Other people are the standard of morality. What we do with other people. Thinking of yourself morally is considered evil, considered bad. No good. But even that's not completely true. Because do we really care about helping other people? Or do we care about the selflessness? My favorite example here and you could, is uh, who's considered like a moral icon? Even, even among Protestants. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is the standard, right? Mother Teresa is a moral paragon. She's this incredibly moral. She's a saint after all. And everybody considers her a saint. Even Jews consider her a saint, right? A saint. Why? What makes Mother Teresa a saint? She's selfless. She's selfless. She left the middle class upbringing. She went to India. And she helped poor people not die. She didn't help them advance in life. She helped them not die. <laughs> now, did she help a lot of people? I mean, thousands. Okay. And she was miserable. We know that. If you read her diaries, you know how miserable and how much suffering she lived but take, let's take the opposite of Mother Teresa. What's the opposite of Mother Teresa? I don't know. You could fill in the black. You could, you could, we could use Jeff Bezos. Right? You could use uh, Amazon. Right? Uh, you could use uh, Bill Gates. You could use Steve Jobs. You could use any of these guys. Like a billionaire. One of these billionaires. Who are the opposite of Mother Teresa. How many people does the billionaire help? Billions. Please. Millions. Maybe hundreds of millions. So how does a billionaire help people? Wait a minute. That doesn't make sense. Billionaires helping people? How do they help people? I think way more transactions. And, and I'm not talking about the charity. Put aside the charity. Forget about charity. You know, based, they provide jobs. 
What do they do? What's the essential thing with a business person does? Starts with a T. Trade. They trade. And what did we just say about trade? What is trade? Win-win. It's win-win. So every time I trade with somebody, the other person is better off, right? So if I do lots of trades, if I do billions of trades, that means billions of times people are better off. Every time you buy something from Amazon, you are better off. Otherwise, why did you do it? And Amazon is better off. And the way Jeff Bezos became so rich is by making all of you better off. There's no other way to become a billionaire. The secret of becoming a billionaire. Here, you want to wait this time. Um, <laughs> the secret to being a billionaire is build a product that everybody wants at a price and willing to pay a price that is higher than what it costs you to produce. And if everybody wants it, we're talking about billions of people, you'll become a billionaire pretty quickly. And if you can do that every year, like iPhone 12 and iPhone 13 and iPhone 14 and iPhone, then, or Windows 1 and Windows 2 and Windows 10 and Windows 55, you'll become a billionaire. That's the way to become a billionaire. But what are you doing when you're doing that? You're making millions of people better off, better than they were previously. Better than they would be otherwise. They chose to engage in this transaction because they believed that their lives would be better. So billionaires improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Mother Teresa improves the lives of thousands of people. Mother Teresa is a saint and billionaires are what? The devil incarnate. They're evil. How does that work? They help more people. Because the interesting thing about the standard for morality that we all live in our culture, in our world, even in the enlightened West, the standard value is not helping other people. The standard is your own selflessness. See, the problem with the billionaires, what's the problem with the billionaires? Expensive. They're enjoying themselves. They're making money. They're benefiting whom? Themselves. In addition to everybody else. Maybe they're improving the lives of hundreds of millions of people, but they are improving their own lives at the same time. And that's unacceptable. <laughs> it's true, it's unacceptable. We don't like it. But Mother Teresa, she didn't benefit. Maybe she went to heaven, right? If you believe in that. But in this world, she didn't benefit. On the contrary, she suffered. Cool. <laughs> we like that. Like I, I, I like to say, you know, Bill Gates, in order to redeem himself from the, from the evil of having made so much money, has set up the largest foundation in the world and he's giving money away. Let's put aside all the conspiracy theories about Bill Gates for, you know, around COVID and stuff for now. You can ask me about them in a Q&A if you want. But he's doing philanthropy. Let's assume it's all positively motivated, right? So when he does philanthropy, do people like him? A little bit, but not so much. Look at all the conspiracy theories. Why? What is it about Bill Gates and his philanthropy? He's trying to help other people and not benefit himself. What is it about Bill Gates that people don't like? Bill Gates. Maybe there's a little bit of envy there. They think his money is tainted. Perhaps. Money's tainted <coughs> because it came from making the world a better place to live. Yeah. Because it, it came from improving everybody's lives. Um, but it's more than that. See, what's the difference between Bill Gates doing charity and Mother Teresa doing charity? He's not suffering. Mm. He still seems like he's having a good time. Have you ever seen him interviewed? It's like he's pretty happy. He seems like he's engaged. He's, he, he really is enjoying this. He's, he doesn't look miserable. And indeed, I don't know if you know this, but in Bill Gates' house, in, um, you know, outside of Seattle, he has a whole room that's a trampoline. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, so yeah, I mean, he could do all the charity he wants. He's never going to be conceived as a good guy if he has a trampoline that big. <laughs> Indoors. He, no good guy, like a moral person, doesn't have a whole room that's a trampoline. That just doesn't go together. 
So there's no way for Bill Gates to become virtuous in the world that perceives virtue as associated with suffering, virtue as associated with selflessness. He is obviously, even in his charity, enjoying it, doing some stuff that he loves. He only gives to some charity. He only gives to some causes, the causes he's chosen. And of course, one of the reflections of the fact that we despise him for this attitude is the fact that now he's associated with every conspiracy theory known to man. You know, it's not the elders of Zion anymore, it's Bill Gates in, 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 in every single conspiracy theory. It's part of the reflection of that in the culture. We go after him for everything because how he made his money, the fact that he made a lot of money, and the fact that he he's, looks like he's having a good time. And they all do. And, you know, if I had that kind of money, I would too. Even with less money. And partially, they have a good time because they actually produce this money. They actually created this wealth. They actually earned it and deserve it. It's not just somebody gave it to them. They didn't just inherit it. They actually worked for it. And that gives them a certain pride and self-esteem that I think is reflected that people are uncomfortable with. Because we're not supposed to have pride. Pride is a sin, not a virtue. I, you know, uh, sometimes I ask, what do you th- how do you think Bill Gates becomes a saint? Well, how would we change our view of Bill Gates? I'm not sure it's possible anymore because he's so tainted now with all this stuff. But how do you think we could make Bill Gates a saint? He gives everything away. He'd have to give everything away. <laughs> have to live in a tent, no trampoline room, <laughs> and you have to bleed a little bit for us. But you got to show some blood, because otherwise how do you show that you're actually suffering and sacrificing? Then people would start feeling for him, and maybe we'd get a street or two named after him. I mean, think about it. Who's made this world, this beautiful world we live in? It's a pretty amazing world we live in. Who built Amsterdam? Amsterdam is probably one of the greatest examples of this. Who built Amsterdam? Traders, businessmen, trade and business built Amsterdam, built New York, built all the great cities in the world. It's the Bill Gateses of their time who built these things. And yet, they're the villains somehow. And when we name streets, I don't know what you name streets in Amsterdam, that I can't pronounce any of them anyway. Um, but in America, we name streets after politicians, after social activists, after generals, but nobody names streets for the people who actually built America. People who built America are business people, industrialists. What do we call them? I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term in America that we use to describe the, 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 the big industrialists of the 19th century who built the country. Robber barons. <laughs> barons, aristocrats, right, from Europe, and robbers, because robber baron comes a term from Europe where the, where the barons, the local aristocrats, used to, used to uh, uh, steal from the passers-by, the toll roads, right? That's who our barons. No, that's zero sum. What happened in America, what still happens in any free market is wealth is created. So we despise the idea of self-interest. And yet the idea of self-interest is at the heart of what an economy, any kind of marketplace, involves. So the first thing that comes to our mind when we think capitalism is self-interest. Everybody knows it's all about self-interest. Self-interest is bad. See how we might benefit materially, but there's got to be some shady stuff. My mother used to tell me, um, in those days, being a millionaire was a big deal. Right today, you have to be a billionaire to be a big deal. But she said, every millionaire in the world is a crook. Everyone is a crook. Because you associate in your mind selfishness or self-interest with thievery, which is what we all think of when we think about self-interest, immorality, and then you say, okay, a system that encourages this kind of behavior has got to be a bad system. Adam Smith, when he wrote uh, The Wealth of Nations, he, he, he understood this and he said, 
The baker doesn't bake the bread for you. What does the baker bread, bake the bread for? Money. Yeah, to make a living. <laughs> Feed his family. Maybe because he loves baking bread. Right? But he doesn't do it for you, he does it for himself. And Adam Smith realized there's a problem here. Because our morality is inconsistent with the idea that it's okay to do things for yourself. She so said, okay, so if we add up all the self-interested actions that happen in the economy, there's something called an invisible hand that turns that into a virtue. So it's good for society. But the actual act of being self-interested eh, is still suspect. Now if it's suspect, if we're suspicious of people who are self-interested, because we are, what do we do to them? Other than not like them. But what do we do practically, politically? What are you going to do if you think that these businessmen are self-interested and self-interested equals bad? What do you do? Taxation. Well, taxation is one aspect. I'll get to taxation in a minute. Redistribution of wealth. But what, what else do you do? A, you tax them, take away some of their gains because they're ill-gotten in some formulation. But what else do you do to them? Regulate them. Yeah, you regulate them. I don't trust you. You're self-interested. You'll cut corners. You'll cheat, lying, steal. Even though we can have the discussion about whether cheating, lying, and stealing are self-interested. So I'm going to put a little bureaucrat on your shoulder, and they're going to check everything that you do. And I'm going to pass regulations that prohibit whole things that you can't do, so I don't have to check. So we regulate them, and we tax and redistribute wealth. Because we say, oh, well, you're not going to help the needy. It's not in your self-interest to do it, so we're going to take your money and give it to them. Because that's the right thing to do. It's not necessarily economically good, but it's the morally right thing to do. And whenever they raise taxes, they don't use economic arguments to raise taxes. They use moral arguments to raise taxes. It's just. It, it helps the needy. In, in California, they raise taxes by 30% on the very rich. And the very rich voted for it. Why? Because they were told, if we don't raise taxes on you, then all these kids won't be able to get an education. It's always the other that's going to suffer unless you sacrifice. And we impose the sacrifice on you because you're not good enough to do it out of your own self-interest. So I believe that the entire welfare state and the regulatory state are driven by our moral ideas. Our moral ideas, our ethical values, are what drive policy, not economics. Nobody gives a damn in Washington, D.C. about economics. Nobody gives a damn in political parties about economics. At the end of the day, it's about what can sell. And what sells, people talk about feel-good stuff. What they're talking about is morality. They don't want to say it's morality because that sounds, you know, pretentious. But what it is, at the end of the day, is morality. And it all comes from the same assumption. This morality of focusing on others, but really a morality of self-sacrifice. Which brings us to objectivism, Ayn Rand's writings. Because Ayn Rand challenges this. She challenges this morality. And she offers us an alternative. Her basic question is, that she starts with, is why? Why should I sacrifice? Why is somebody else's life more important than mine? Why should I place the well-being of other people before my own? Why? You only have one life, as far as we know. I'm pretty sure you only have one life. Why not make the most of it? Why not be happy? Why not live well, flourish, succeed, thrive as an individual? Why suffer? Why sacrifice? Right? What's sacrifice? Trade is win-win. What's sacrifice? What's sacrifice? Lose-win. Yeah, it's lose-win, which almost always turns into lose-lose. Why is it lose-win? How do we know it's lose-win? 
Because otherwise it wouldn't be a sacrifice. The whole point of having a concept called sacrifice, separate than a concept called trade, is the idea that I'm losing. I'm giving up something in return for what? Nothing or something less valuable to me. I have to be in a worse situation. Well, virtue, right? It's like today everyone's virtue signaling, so you get back currency of virtue. Yes, but again, it's it's in in, in reality. Yeah, it's not worth anything. It's not worth anything. Yeah. And the virtue signaling is all about this idea of sacrifice. It's not about the idea of anything else. So, so your virtue signaling. And the question is, why is that a virtue? Why is it a virtue to 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 put to, to lose? Why is it a virtue not to pursue your own life, not to pursue your own interests, not to pursue your own passions? Why is it a virtue to rely on other people and to focus your attention, your energy, and everything on other people rather than your own life, your own success, your own long-term flourishing? So for Rand, the common, the standard morality that we have in the world today just doesn't make any sense. Because what's the answer to why? Why should I live that kind of life? It's because somebody said so. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's my philosopher friend. But there's no reasoning. There's no connection. And it flies contrary to your own life. So when develops a philosophy, a moral code, based on the idea of individual human flourishing, of success, and living a good life. What does that require? We're not going to go through the whole ethics, but just quickly, what does that require? What does it require? Never mind even, live a good life. What does it require for human beings even to survive? What do you need to do in order to survive? Think. Yeah, you got to, somebody be reading the uh, notes, right? <laughs> what makes us human? What is the unique way in which we survive that other animals don't have? Social interaction. Uh, even social interaction is downstream from this because you have to do this to be able to even to get to the point where there's something to communicate about and there's something you're communicating. Yeah, you have to you have to be able to reason. You have to be able to think. I mean, we're in this weird animal that we don't have. We don't have the genetic programming. To know how to survive. Like you plop somebody in the middle of the Amazon naked. How do you survive? You can survive. But it's not guaranteed. How are you going to survive? Like if you take an animal from, I don't know, from the north. And you put them in the Amazon. How long? They won't survive for very long. They'll die like that. Human beings won't. Why? What can we do that is different than other animals? Yeah, we can adapt our environment to suit us. We don't just, we don't have a program. We can change the programming. We can change the world around us. So, we don't have the gene for agriculture. Some genius had to figure agriculture out and then teach us. And then we all adopted agriculture. I mean, even hunting, people think hunting, oh, we're all genetically programmed to hunt. I mean, I look around this room, pretty much any room. I mean, we're pathetic animals. Look at you. You're weak. All of us, weak. On a biological scale. We're slow. No fangs, no claws. Right? You guys try running down a bison and eating into it. Biting into it. You're not going to get there. Right? Yeah, some, some of you are imagining this. No, it won't work. <laughs> It doesn't work. But how do we, you know, I, I can't say this in Amsterdam, I don't think. But, you know, if I'm talking in Denver, somewhere in the Midwest, I often say, yeah, but I just had a bison burger around the corner. <laughs> how do you get a bison burger? How do you kill a bison? Not with this. How do you kill it? With tools. Right? With, with weapons. Traps. With traps. With strategy. What are those products of? The human mind. Of reasoning, of thinking, of figuring stuff out, solving problems. 
What makes humans humans is our ability to reason. Ability to observe reality, integrate it, abstract from it, reorganize it in our minds, and then go into reality and actually reorganize it in reality. Production. That's what production is. We produce stuff. We don't just live. We don't just sleep outdoors. We build buildings. Right? And they're a little more complicated than nests. We build skyscrapers. We don't accept nature as it is. We adapt nature to fit our needs. That's what makes us human. So, a morality that is fitting for human beings is a morality that says, yeah, you should live your life for yourself in pursuit of your own happiness, of your own success. And how do you do that? Well, by using what is human, which is your mind. So for Rand, the purpose of morality is your happiness, your success, your flourishing. And the means to be moral is to be human. It's to think. It's to use your mind. It's to reason. If you took her egoistic philosophy, her egoistic moral code, in one word, what would it be? Think. It's nothing more selfish than that, right? And indeed, the lying, cheating, still being, it's not selfish because what usually happens to liars, cheaters, and thieves? Unless they're in politics. <laughs> they get caught. They get caught. In politics, you can get caught, it doesn't matter. But you, you, they get caught, and bad stuff happens to them, right? And even in politics, anybody ever meet, I don't know if there's anybody in politics here, so I have to be careful. But anybody ever meet a happy politician? I've never met one. <laughs> It's hard. Why? Because politicians don't necessarily, most of the time, function based on reason. It's about manipulating people. It's not about solving problems, real problems. Sadly. I know you guys are affiliated with a political party, but that's part of the challenge. Is this politics is about what? Well, what's politics about? Certainly today, what's politics about? Force. Politics is about coercion. It's not voluntary. Laws are passed, means what? You have to do it. Otherwise, force is applied against you. So politics is not deal with the voluntary. It's not deal with the chosen. It doesn't deal with reasoning individuals doing what they unless the politics is protecting that. But politics is about force, coercion. And when you apply force and coercion, that inappropriately, I would say, to intervene in free exchange between people, to intervene in the choices individuals make, which all our politicians do, it's corrupting. There's just no way around it. It's corrupting because you're using force where it's inappropriate to use force. So, if we value capitalism, if we value the end result of capitalism, which is more wealth, more production, more freedom, more choices, more opportunities, we need a new moral code. We need to abandon the existing moral code. We need to abandon the idea of sacrifice. We need to abandon the idea of selflessness. And then you need to embrace a moral code that's consistent with the outcome. Not just because it's consistent with the outcome, but because it makes sense. We need to figure out a moral code of how to live as individuals, how to make our lives the best that they can be. Not how to sacrifice, but how to live. And that's Ayn Rand's project, if you will. And that's what I think all morality should be about. Figuring out how individual human life can be the best that it can be. And if we can figure that out, then capitalism is easy. I mean, think about where capitalism started. 
think of America maybe as the as the first capitalist country in the sense of the kind of freedom that was established there. Well, it starts with a document, a document that declares that all men have the rights, equal rights, inalienable rights, to their own life, not to sacrifice, not to suffer, but to their own life, to live their lives, to their own liberty, speak, write, anything they want. And in the most selfish political statement in all of human history, every individual has an inalienable right to pursue their own happiness. Now, that's a revolution right there. And that's the revolution that created the modern world, that created the wealth that we have. That's the revolution that we have to rediscover. And now I think, that's why you should read Ayn Rand, I think we have the tools, much better tools, much more, much deeper philosophy to justify the idea of the pursuit of happiness leading to a great world and a great life. Thank you all.